the fifth continents preparing for the Olympic Games in Sydney. Australia's Aborigines have threatened huge demonstrations to draw attention to discrimination against them. They see the Olympics as a festival of the white establishment. Aborigines feel they're treated as second-class people. In Australian sports institutes, athletes train for the Games. Amongst the 600 athletes, just 20 are Aborigines. It's much more tougher to actually get into these teams, especially because we're naturally talented and we find it just a bit harder when it comes to uh, political and bureaucratics. Because of this, some of Australia's indigenous population are calling on all black athletes to boycott the Games. There's also talk of a blockade of Olympic countries. Uh, we've said that there's going to be mass protests. Um, now, our, our advisory committee supports Aboriginal protests so that we can let the world know that Aboriginal people are not getting the deal that the world thinks we are. The Redfern All Blacks, the Black Aborigines, is no ordinary rugby club. It's the second oldest organisation involved with Aboriginal rights and fighting racism. The element of racism is, is alive and well in the, in the national game of rugby league. Yes, very much so. And one would think that on the eve of the biggest event, sporting event in the world, that these sports in institutions would take time out to clean up their act with regard to racial vilification and, and to wipe racism, not only off the football field, but across the spectrum. Barely three kilometres away from Sydney's financial district live many Aborigines in the four blocks called Redfern. These people, formerly living in tune with their environment, now live in the city in bitter poverty. Alcohol and heroin are destroying their lives. They think they're better than us, but they're not. And, um, well, there's a big stereotype, you know, about how Aboriginal people are, and, you know, we're all bludgers, we're all, you know, all drunks, all drug addicts, all thieves and shit. And, like, well, it's not true, and, well, uh, after time, well, uh, they just use that to keep us down. Half of young Aborigines never get any qualifications from school, and almost 40% are unemployed. Here, they voluntarily gather up rubbish and use needles. By doing this, they lose a part of their unemployment benefit, but they want to fight the stereotype that says they're good for nothing. It's just they, they, they just want to work, they don't care. So long as they got a job, get up every morning, come to work, to be active. It's, um, I think, sense of pride in what people are saying that Aboriginal people are lazy. These people are not lazy. They just want to prove to, prove to everyone that they, uh, they, they, they're ready to work with anyone. Robbed of their traditional way of life, the Aborigines have never found a connection to white society. Joyce Ingram has some Aboriginal blood in her and gives support to many Aborigines in Redfern. Few residents of this area manage to get out of the vicious circle of poverty, alcohol abuse and prison. Joyce blames the racism of white Australians. White society here has almost no contact with the Aborigines. Yet they have been feted by celebrities as big as singer Michael Jackson and the American actress Whoopi Goldberg, who visited to show their support. According to Joyce, they're very nice people. Oh, yeah, lovely people, aren't they? But they're small. Little tiny, yeah. But they're, they're lovely people. They straight in there. No police knew. Every time they come in, no police knew nothing about them. Then, he went out to Long Bay Jail with the Aboriginal colours on, or the football colours. See the boys at the back, Long Bay Jail. Uh, For her work with Aboriginal people, Joyce was awarded an honorary doctorate of Aboriginal affairs. 
She is proud of it, but also feels the full-blooded Aborigines look down their nose at her for being of mixed race. But the, the full-blooded Aborigines look at us, and they, uh, they say, the yellow people, they got no respect for us. And that's the full-blooded one, but they're the, they're the, the originals. The full or full-blooded be different things. But they look down their nose at us, the, the yellow people. So we are more or less hanging out on the, on the outside. And we're about to stay in, inside within the, um, the fold, if you like. Funny country, isn't it? <laughs> Joyce had eight children, but only four have survived. Not an unusual case amongst Aborigines. One of her grandchildren recently came into conflict with the law. The probation officer regularly comes looking for her. Many Aborigines claim the police harass them. Uh, specifically in this area, you wouldn't have to uh, stay around here long before you see a police presence. About 30,000 people live in Redfern. The crime rate in this part of Sydney is high. The police admit they may come down too hard on Aborigines. The police here in the past have probably, probably um, approached the, um, the policing of, um, of crime issues on the block um, somewhat aggressively but uh, perhaps um, the aggressive policing of not only the block area but uh, other areas of, of metropolitan Sydney has seen a, uh, a decrease or a diminishing in, um, in police and communities' relationships. The human rights organisation, Amnesty International, has criticised the Australian sentencing laws. Many Aborigines die in custody, either through unsatisfactory medical care or suicide. In front of the old Parliament building in the federal capital of Canberra, an illegally erected Aboriginal embassy has stood for 28 years. They want to draw attention to the fact that not only are they treated as second-class citizens, but their land rights are also under threat. For over 200 years, the Aboriginals have been fighting for their land. In 1992, they were granted ownership on the grounds of traditional use but only a few still live that way. Now, they have to prove a spiritual, cultural and physical link, impossible for those of mixed race. A white man's lie, born of history. You find that Cook had legal binding orders, Captain James Cook, to take possession with the consent of the natives. But instead, he went back to England with a legal lie, which was Terranullius, which meant the country was uninhabited, that no one existed here. And when Captain Philip came out here in 1788 with the, with the penal colony, you must remember this sprang from a penal colony, uh, he came out with orders, so he continued to act the war which Captain James Cook started. And you know, the other pieces of his orders there, you'd take the land from the idiots referring to Aboriginal people. And that's what they've done. Aborigines lived in Australia for at least 40,000 years before the Europeans arrived. Family clans were spread across the continent, speaking 300 different languages and 700 dialects. Since the beginning of the 20th century, there have been efforts to forcefully assimilate Aborigines into white society. The fire at the embassy is holy for the Aborigines. It has a symbolic value and plays a decisive role in all ceremonies. So it is a special place and I think also it's the one place that the people have been consistent in their fight for sovereignty. And for those of us a um, few years ago who, you know, and still now, who um, thought justice was going to come, like myself, sooner. Here I am, and we can't even get a national apology or justice for it.